summarise the philosophy of the Harp Consort? The Harp Consort is not really about a particular repertoire, and not even about a fixed group of people. It's really more about a way of thinking about the music. Probably the most important part of that thinking is that we're trying to be simultaneously very historical and completely in the moment of performance. And the main way we're doing this is not by sort of updating the music and trying to make it relevant to a modern audience with some kind of new gimmicks and things we've invented. Rather, I think some of the things that are, are very historical are the most interesting and unusual for an audience to hear. So what we're trying to do is to do our homework well before the project starts, do all the investigation, find out how the music should be played, how it was played at the time, how people improvised variations, all the things they did to change what was written. But then all of that research, we try to put behind us and sort of internalize it so that what we do in the performance is play very spontaneously, but with a spontaneity that we've, if you like, that we've educated ourselves and a spontaneity that we've channeled in certain directions ahead of time. What does govern who plays in the harp consort? How do you choose your colleagues? When it comes to selecting colleagues to play with, there's a mix of historical and modern performance considerations. From the historical side, we're looking at the typical instruments for that particular repertoire, for that particular country and time. But from the point of view of performance, I'm looking for the right mix of personalities. And so, for example, if one of our regular players is not available for a certain gig, I might not replace them with someone else who plays that exact instrument. More likely, I'll replace them with somebody who plays another instrument, which is appropriate to that period and time, and somebody who is also a strong personality, rather than replacing them with somebody who just happens to play the same instrument. And that means that each time we do the same concert, it's going to change because of the mix of people that are there. When so much of the music is improvised, then changing one person for another um, perhaps changes the instrument that's in there, but it will change the personality who's in there, and that means a big change. How did you come to the idea of putting together a programme of Caravan Irish music? Well, as a harpist, the music of Tullaho Caravan is absolutely central. He is the most famous Irish harpist, perhaps the most famous Irish composer. And so it was an obvious target for a historical harpist. But in another way, quite a daring target to aim for. Caravan is regarded by traditional musicians as a the grandfather of Irish traditional music, and to approach this repertoire as a historical harpist and as an early musician, it's quite challenging. For a start, the harp that it was being played on at the time is nothing like the modern Irish folk harp. And the approach to the music is quite different. Today's traditional players mostly base their approaches on the way Caroline's music was preserved in the oral tradition, largely based on manuscript sources from the early 19th century, which were then passed down in the oral tradition. Those manuscripts were noted down from the playing of itinerant summer harpists, but actually mostly violin and flute players. Those musicians had themselves moulded the music from the way Caroline wrote it and from the way it was published shortly after his death. And so the earliest sources that we have are quite different to the versions that traditional players know and love today. So it's kind of like Chinese whispers? There's a Chinese whispers element to it and that's one of the wonderful things of working with this repertoire is that as the music was passed down in the oral tradition, it was um, embellished, it was enriched, it was changed. Quite often the changes were in the direction of making things more catchy, more dancey, easier to grasp by ear, easier to grasp instantly. Caroline himself was working 
if you like, in both traditions. He was working, he himself was an itinerant musician. He was blind, and so he wasn't able to write down his own music. Um, rather, he composed by ear, but only partially by ear. Because he was an educated man, he'd gone blind as a teenager. So he, he was a middle-class, educated man, who had later gone blind, and who had therefore turned to the harp and to the harp traditions from a slightly different background. And although he did compose by ear, perhaps a more accurate description would be to say that he composed by button. Because he used to use the buttons of his coat as an imaginary music stave and think of composing his music not on the fine li five lines of a music stave but on the five buttons of his coat. And so he's somewhere between the sort of learned, intellectual, composed, written tradition and the oral um, uh, folk tradition, if you like. And his music sits right in that gap, some pieces being more in the high art tradition, some being more um, dance music and with all the energy of low art. Uh, what do you like most about being on the road with For me, it's a great group to be in, never mind being the director of it. Um, it sounds like a very sort of lovey, theatrical thing to say, but I actually feel immensely privileged to be a member of this group. Um, and I don't feel I own it. I feel I guide it, but I can't push it. I can steer it gently, um, but it's created by all of us together, not just by me. And that's the great thing for me in the concerts, the moments where somebody else is taking a solo and I sit back and I think, wow, I have about the best seat in the house. I'm within several feet of one of these musicians playing like this and I can just sit here and enjoy it and I can even have the fun of joining in with it. That's an amazing thing. Mm -hmm.